Thank you very much for coming here to this press conference. Um, Sam mentioned uh, most of it. We've been traveling abroad to meet um, different people, both from Europe and from our diaspora. Uh, and we've been doing this uh, regularly now. We went to the United States um, and now we've come to the EU, uh, trying to get a sense of what is going on here and also to give people a little bit of a sense of what is going on uh, back home. So happy to take your questions. Yes, please. Uh, I have three questions, if that's okay. Let's start. Um, can we do one at a time, please? Uh, can we do one at a time? That's what I'll do. All right. The first question is, what was the main message for the parliamentarians here? And what do you expect from them? What do you expect from Europe? Have you come with any sort of expectation that you tell them, give them a message, and then you want them to do something? No. Um, and it's more of a conversation than a message. Uh, I'm no one to come and give a message to the Europeans. Uh, it's an exchange of ideas uh, about what is going on uh, in India, what's going on here, the type of cooperation that we can do. Um, so it's more of a, the frame is a conversation. Um, we discussed with the parliamentarians across the board, relationship between India and Europe. Um, changing globe, uh, transition, you know, into a new sort of energy paradigm, into a new mobility paradigm. So that, that was what the discussion was about. Was very what fruitful. What happening in India? What did you tell them? Could you elaborate a little bit, please? Yeah, we were, we were giving them a sense of uh, the type of challenges India is facing, um, uh, economic challenges, other challenges. The general sort of attack on the democratic democratic institution so that's what we discussed yes can you speak a little louder welcome to brussels and thanks so much for organizing this uh i had a quick job basically here on the eve of g20 most of the european leaders are back in Delhi. Hey. And they're going to be meeting with Mr. Modi. They're going to be meeting with the government there. And my question to you is, um, do you feel with all of these... Sorry, can you hear We can hear you. Yeah. Do you feel with all of these meetings they're going to be having, the Western leaders, are they giving Hindu nationalism a free pass? Are they giving the um, persecution of Muslims and minorities a free pass in India right now? No, I don't, I don't think... Um... I think the G20 is an important conversation uh, and it's a good thing that India is hosting it. Of course, there are, there are issues in India that uh, we raise, but I don't think, I, I think the framing that are they giving them a free pass is, is not exactly correct. Um, so do you think that obviously there's a war going on in Europe right now and there's been this constant uh, um, I wouldn't say an allegation, but there, there is the fact that, that India has poor solutions with Russia, and we've had European leaders uh, talking to India about it, and do you feel in this aspect of trying to lure India away from Russia, they want to bring up the uh, persecution of minorities and Muslims in India, leaders from the West? No, I mean, uh, India, of course, has a relationship uh, with Russia. India has a relationship with the United States. India is a large country and by nature of being a large country, it will have relationships with many other countries. So uh, that's a normal thing. That's not, you know, India has every right to have a relationship with whoever it wants. Uh, there is, of course, uh, there are serious issues about uh, the type of actions that are being taken. With regards to with regards to institutions, with regards to democracy and stuff, and yeah, we would hope that uh, there is a sense that there are is there are underlying issues. Can I just have a follow up? Hold up, no, please just yes, sir. 
uh, we don't require national use agency uh, of Ukraine. We know that the Modi government takes quite a cautious position on the conflict and the war Russia held, uh, Russia held uh, uh, against Ukraine. So that my I curious, what is uh, the opposition point of view on the issue? And uh, the related question, uh, is that cautious position of the Indian government related to the uh, sharp increasing of the oil supply, uh, supply of Russian uh, oil to India? Thank I you. think uh, the opposition, by and large, would agree with India's position, uh, current position on the conflict. Uh, we have a uh, we have a relationship with Russia, and I don't think the opposition would have a different view than what the government is currently proposing. Hello, I am from actually Kashmir. I would like to ask a uh, question related to Kashmir issue. And uh, what is what would be your uh, policy if you came into the power next uh, election? Is hopefully. And uh, uh, recently, four years before, the Article 370 was abrogated, uh, and even opposition leaders were uh, uh, restricted to visit and meet the people. And uh, how you see the future of Kashmir? Thank you. I mean, uh, our position on Article 370 is very clear. Uh, it's in a resolution passed in the CWC of the Congress Party. I would urge you to take a look at that. Um, of course, we are we are for ensuring that every single person in our country um, has a voice, is allowed to express themselves, and uh, we feel very strongly that uh, Kashmir should develop. Kashmir should progress, and there should be peace in Kashmir. Good morning. Thank you very much, Rachel Gabori, uh, pilot for DEV. Um, I just would like to know what are your next priorities, political priorities, and what uh, will be your world vision um, in the context of uh, growing tensions. Thank you. What would be my what your your view on international what relations what? in a difficult context that we are uh, now? I've been I've been saying uh, in all my meetings um, that it is pretty clear that China is proposing a particular view, a particular vision of the planet, right and. They are putting on the table the idea of the Belt and Road. And one of the reasons they are able to do that is because they have become a center of global production. And this is something I told the people yesterday um, in the external affairs um, office. But I don't see an alternative vision coming from our side. That, that vision requires a vision for production in a democratic environment. What the Chinese have basically shown is that it is possible to produce effectively in a coercive environment where you don't give people freedom, where you restrict their freedom, but you offer them prosperity without uh, political freedom. And the challenge for us is can we provide an alternative vision where we do production under democratic conditions with political and economic freedom. And I think there's a lot of cooperation that can happen between the United States, between Europe and between us. And I think that's where a lot of our focus should go. How can we create an alternative to the Chinese production model that is a coercive production model. Um, a competitive vision. This is Malini from CPI. Um, you've given a very dignified answer to G20 uh, happening in India is a very good thing. And we have news that uh, Malika Arjun uh, Kharge has not been invited for the G20 uh, dinner by the BJP. And uh, that uh, 
says a lot, and I would like you to comment on that because you are holding a very good stand supporting the uh, G20 happening in India, and here we have a very contrary, very very uh, interesting. Uh, no, what what's what's contrary about it? I mean, he, they've decided not to invite the leader of the opposition. It but tells then, you it tells you something. Uh, I mean, it it tells you that um, they don't value the the leader of. 60% of India's population and you know it's something that people should think about why they are why they are feeling the need to do that and what is the type of thinking that goes behind that uh, follow up question as well i was there uh, in paris to cover mr modi's uh, you know bastille day uh, uh, parade uh, event and uh, two things happened at that time which is very controversial uh, there was a 17 year old boy who was shot in france and the French actually uh, jailed about a thousand people just so that the event would go peacefully. And at the same time, I didn't, I didn't realize that. Happened, um, hmm. And the EU tried to raise that issue, but uh, there was no conversation on that uh, uh, in the platform. And instead, there was a lot of retaliation from the uh, you know Indian ministries uh, regarding the same that this should not be brought up. Because we were actually talking of freedom at that time in France, and I thought that uh, that issue should have been brought up. But what do you think about that? About have you spoken about it here when you uh, about what about the Manipur issue, the human rights uh, issues that we're facing? Yeah, I mean, our our position on Manipur was very clear. Uh, I actually visited Manipur, um, and I think I think we are very much for democratic rights, harmony, peace between people. I mean, I as Sam said, I I walked four thousand kilometers uh, for that very purpose. And I think there is a sense in India that um, the, the democratic structures of our country, the institutional structures of our country are under attack. And they're under attack from uh, the group of people who are running India. I don't think this point is missed by anybody. I think everybody... Uh, who has even a little bit of an understanding of India knows this, but of course there are other considerations. So when you know when you're dealing with India these days, uh, there are other considerations which are also important, as you would be well aware. Yeah. The 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 democratic fight and the fight for democracy in India is ours. And it's our responsibility, and we will take care of it, and we will make sure that uh, the sort of onslaught on our uh, institutions and our freedom is stopped. The opposition will will make sure it happens. Yes, sir. Sir, <laughs> आप हिंदी में जवाब चाहते हैं या इंग्लिश में? You decide. You ask. Okay, I'll. No, the um, the aim of the visit is to meet uh, our diaspora here, uh, to engage with them, to get a sense of what they're dealing with. Uh, what they're going through. That's one one aspect. The second aim is to meet um, members of the government here, MPs, other people, and to get a sense of how they're seeing India, how they're seeing the possible cooperation between India and Europe, how they view India, what they think India should be doing, and also giving them a bit of a sense of what we think uh, our relationship should look like. Microphone. We can hear you. I think. My name is Edward Hardy. For a regional radio in France, in Brittany, where in fact we have an association, Armor India, which has been started by an industrialist who works in India for his company. And then when he retired, he started that uh, that association. 
and uh, bringing Indian, wonderful Indian culture to this remote part of France. Now, last night, um, I saw on, a, uh, on French television a reputation program which has usually good reputation. It's Envoyé Special on France 2. And uh, they describe all the discriminations, discriminations about the Muslims, about the Christians, in very cruel terms. And uh, this was a program of God created. You can still see it on the uh, well, website. Ma'am? And uh, I know you're going to France, so I just would like to uh, know about the situation of all those discriminations in, uh, in, in India. Thank you. I mean, of course, I would have to see the program before I could comment on whether it was exaggerated or not. So I, I don't know what that program was saying. Um, but certainly there is an increase in discrimination and in violence in India. And there is a full scale assault on the democratic institutions of our country. That is that everybody knows. And internally in India, it's been commented on and globally it's been commented on. Uh, and uh, of course minorities are under attack but so are many other communities uh, Dalit communities, tribal communities, uh, lower caste communities are also under attack there is a there is a attempt to change the nature of our country our country uh, in the constitution is designed is, um, described as a union of states and we believe that the most critical aspect of our union is the conversation between members of our union and there is an alternative vision which is the BJP vision which believes that power should be centralized power should be concentrated wealth should be concentrated and the conversation between members of the union between people of India should be suppressed and so this is the this is the fight between two visions I like to term it the fight between Mahatma Gandhi's vision and Nathuram Godse's vision Nathuram Godse being the person who assassinated our leader Hello, yeah so there are a lot of people here who had no idea you were here Indians I'm talking about and they would have liked a public meeting you know, a lot of sort of, you know, people who identify themselves as liberal Indians who still believe in the idea of, uh, you know, a, a, a pluralistic India. And they were like, oh, he's here. We have no idea. Why is there no public meeting? And so why do you think is, we did not organize that to sort of meet, you know, have an open, uh, if, if, I'm, if I'm allowed finish, an open meeting to meet all kinds of Indians who would have liked to sort of to see you or, you know, or talk to you. And the second question is last Let's Let's deal with one question at a time. Well, so I, one, one, relax. You can ask two. No, one second. So, one. so, when we design these tours, we have a structure, and the organizers decide whether we are going to have closed door meetings, whether we're going to have public meetings and stuff like that, depending on the length of the tour and the type of place we're going to. So, I guess in Belgium, we we sort of opted for a model. By the way, hundreds of people are coming and meeting us. And pretty much everybody in Belgium who of Indian origin knows exactly uh, where I am, and and they've been coming and coming by droves to come and see me. But I think we decided that a full-blown Indian-style public meeting in Belgium might not be uh, the best way to do it. You said in the past you was you were spied on by the government. Is that still true? Do, do you have any more information? Are you still being spied on by the Indian government? I mean, the fact that Pegasus was on my phone uh, is a known fact. I mean, I don't, I don't know the details of how I'm tracked, but I'm certainly tracked for sure. Yes. I, uh, in fact, just going back to the Bharat Jodo Yatra, um, there is also. I think I'm very loud. <laughs> yeah, everybody can hear me. All right. All right. Um, uh, I have heard a lot of speeches before starting 2014 onwards, you have been mentioning a very, very important uh, 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 you know, uh, crisis that is coming up in India. Uh, the unemployment of the youths, uh, which is at the highest level right now. Uh, while you were on your uh, yatra across the country, 
uh, did you meet the youths and did this issue actually really come up yeah. many times uh, yeah i did in states? i met i met thousands and thousands of youngsters and all of them said exactly what you're saying um the three things they said number one unemployment number two huge increase in the levels of poverty and completely skewed income distribution so few people getting very very wealthy and the bulk of people uh, you know being pushed back into poverty and then uh, rising prices and inflation those were the three things that repeatedly they told me uh, the fact of the matter is that india has the highest unemployment that it's had in the last 40 years so there is something clearly wrong with our economic model it's not it's not accepted uh, and there's a lot of uh, media support for the government so those type of things don't come out but i don't think the current path we are on economic path we are on is sustainable in any way and there'll be there will certainly be uh, consequences and a backlash to this model yes sir Kashmir is of course an integral part of India so it's uh, nobody's business other than our own other than um, India's business our position uh, as i stated earlier is very clear it's in a working committee resolution um we can give you a copy of that resolution if you're interested in reading it but i feel that it's very important you know the general discussion we are having here that democratic institutions democratic structures need to be protected in india and the voice of people need to needs to be defended and protected and that goes for every single part of india including kashmir conversation now about the name of the subcontinent and your yatra was called Bharat Jodo and now, yeah. we, now the we're now having a name change yes is that is that happening what are you I don't know you have to ask the prime minister I mean do you want to change do you want to change the you know these are these are Bharat Jodo so I am I am perfectly happy with the names that we have in our constitution um, India that is Bharat works perfectly well for me um, but I think these in a sense to me are panic reactions um there's a little there's a little bit of fear in the government um these are distraction tactics we of course came out with the name india for our for our coalition and it's a fantastic idea because it represents exactly who we are we are we consider ourselves to be the voice of india and so the 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 word works very well but it's obviously disturbed the prime minister enough that he wants to change the name of the country which which is absurd but that's what it is uh, it's also interesting that every time we raise the issue of mr adani and crony capitalism the prime minister comes out with some dramatic new diversion tactic you know it's curious that just after i did a press conference on adani uh, this entire uh, diversion is is put into place it's interesting yes ma'am yes uh, eu journalist for uh, radio uh, time again thank you um in view of the uh, cop 20 cop 28 uh, the climate conference in dubai what are your expectations and uh do you think that india is going to be the major spokes spokesperson for the global south thank you well i don't know i mean i think india has a relationship with the global south and i think uh, there are there are bonds there historical bonds there that make us um 
make us close to the global south i don't know if we are the spokesman of the global south but certainly we have a relationship with them um on the environment of course we are as a planet going through these large transitions energy transition transition in the way uh, we move and i think uh, environment is a central issue uh, for for india um, it's of course not in a in a country in a country where there are many poor people uh, it's difficult to make environment top of mind but i think it is a critical issue and it's very important that we uh, think about it in a strategic and a long term way thanks uh, brian Br 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 brian ricketts representing the european coal industry and i've enjoyed visits european? to european coal, coal industry, industry and i've enjoyed visits to coal power plants and mines in india and my hope for the future is a democratic india and the question relates to that. As China developed very rapidly over the last few decades, its economy became imbalanced and it's now paying the price for that, I believe. How would you ensure that India's economy doesn't become imbalanced? So how to balance the powers of a market-based economy versus central planning? I think one of the lessons that I learned um, in my walk was that there is an inherent and profound wisdom in the people of my country, right? Uh, regardless of which part of society they're in. Um, for example, we're discussing environment. Uh, the type of conversations I had with tribal people about the environment were far more sophisticated than I have with you know people living in in cities, right? So there is an inherent wisdom in the people of India, and I'm sure in the people of Europe and people of Belgium. Uh, and I think it's critical for us that in decision making, we listen to the voice and the intelligence of the people, and that's where we have a fundamental difference with the bjp we we value the voice of the people we value the voice of poor people we value the voice of all stakeholders and we want to hold a conversation with stakeholders before we make decisions it's sometimes slower but in the long run uh, it works out much better and that's really the conflict that is taking place uh, in india they are of the view that you don't need to ask people you just go ahead and you know slam everything through uh, but in our view there's consequences with regards to the public sector and the private sector uh, we are pretty clear that in key strategic areas public sector should have a role in education in healthcare public sector should provide a foundation but in other spaces private industry is probably a better tool to achieve most aims just one or two more one. quick very quick one. But um, you asked like you uh, know, asked four questions. Let, you asked you asked three or four questions. Yeah, please, thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Nobody else. Go ahead. Then one or two. That's it. Um, I I think the agenda that you're talking about mostly what has been happening in the um uh, in the election manifestos usually you know the manifestos of the parties. Uh, uh, that's how the elections were initially fought uh, or, uh, you know, held, where parties came and spoke about the manifestos. Now, with all the changes that have happened in India, we know so many PSUs have been privatized or are uh, on the verge of being pri privatized in India. Uh, how, in case, in uh, next year's elections, uh, in case uh, uh, tables turn and uh, we see the opposition and the alliance probably coming forward and uh, running the country, how do you think those kind of changes that were, you know, that is so massive that have been happening, uh, can be reverted no, like which, or which changes? corrected? Right. You know, the privatization of uh, public sector uh, units, yeah. you know, that has been happening in India. How do you actually rectify that? Because that has actually taken away employment of so many housewives. I mean, women like my mother would probably be a, a very good candidate for an SBI uh, 
you know, banking job, but a private sector will not necessarily employ a person uh, of her age and will look for a more competitive, uh, you know, uh, growth. So I think that's where I see, see a lot of people will lose employment because of this in India where, and are doing that. How does this get rectified? Where, if, where we draw the line is the notion of crony capitalism, right? We don't have a problem with the private sector. We don't have a problem with the government sector. Where we draw the line is where one or two people starts, start to financially control the whole country, right? And where one or two people or three people are running everything. That's where our problem begins. Uh, there's another element to this, which is that government policies in India have systematically attacked the backbone of our um, employment system. If you look at who gives employment in India, it's the small and medium industry that gives employment in India. And demonetization and GST have devastated those structures. Right? So it's a, it's a two-pronged attack that the government is carrying out. Number one, impose a huge transaction cost on all small and medium businesses and ensure that you build two or three monopolies, monopolists who control pretty much everything. Right? So if you look at Mr. Adani, our problem with Mr. Adani is he controls the ports, he controls the airports, he controls agriculture, he controls the grain silos, he has real estate. I mean, he's everywhere. And he's dominant everywhere. He controls cement. right? So. We think that's counterproductive for the country. And, and on one side, they are pushing this very monopolistic capital. And on the other side, they're devastating the small and medium people from where we're going to get a job. That's why we're having an unemployment crisis. And the second part is where you require key services. right? Um, country like India requires the government to be involved in education. It requires the government to be involved in healthcare. And the idea that you can just privatize education and privatize healthcare, it devastates the poorest people because they simply do not have access to this. So they are, they are hitting this from three or four sides, and the solutions are pretty clear. I mean, we would invest much more in health and education. We would protect small and medium businesses. We would we would try to build an economy where small and medium businesses transition to medium businesses and then to large businesses and then to massive businesses right if you look at if you look at our small and medium businesses almost none of them become big businesses right they just they remain small or they die right and that's is because of policy so you can change policies to ensure that you start building uh, champions in these in these uh, smaller and medium spaces and you can certainly invest much more in education and healthcare I'm not saying there's no role for uh, private businesses in education. There is. But the mainstay of any education system in a country like India has to be, uh, you know, it's a government responsibility. And the government can't just say, okay, we are going to, you know, abrogate from this responsibility. So the, the things that can be done and need to be done are pretty clear. They're not, they're not complicated. And if you look at our last manifesto, I think uh, we, we, ironed out quite a few of these ideas. One of the other ideas that we have, uh, which we have tested now, uh, you, can, you can get a sense of how we think about these things by looking at our states. So if you look at the healthcare system in Rajasthan, that will give you a good sense of what we are thinking in terms of healthcare for the country. If you look at our uh, social programs in Karnataka, you get a sense of how we are thinking about social programs for the country. So we tend to uh, run a pilot somewhere, see if it works, and then scale it up. And you know, for example, Manrega was was such a case where we ran a small pilot, then we scaled it into a state, and then we scaled it into the nation. We don't believe in you know these rash decisions where you suddenly demonetize the economy or you suddenly impose a GST. We believe in seeding an idea, letting that idea grow, testing the idea, and then scaling scaling it across. Um, Chhattisgarh has some very good ideas on how to support farmers with minimum prices. 
Karnataka has our, you know, the the sort of support that we're giving to women in Karnataka. That's uh, some very interesting work that's going on. And each, in each one of our states, you can see the sort of type of ideas that we will use uh, when we come to power. Last question. When you were talking to the parliamentarians, you said it was a conversation and you were informing them about sharing, you know, your reading of what's happening in India. And you have repeated here that, you know, there are problems back home when it comes to institutions and democratic structures. What was their response to you? Did they seem concerned? Did they seem... Yeah, they were very concerned. Uh, they were very concerned and, and they felt uh, that uh, there is a they felt that there is an attempt um, to stifle the democratic structures of India, for sure. And I mean, they were very, very clear with us. Okay. We have more questions. You have more questions? Yeah. No, have I, more think, questions? I think I think I, uh, I think five questions for one person is good enough. I mean, if you. <laughs> You know. Okay. Responses well, are coming to everybody. Thank you. No, but thank you very much no, for your time. Yeah. We really appreciate. Thank you, Rahul. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank we you. hope to see you again. Be in touch. Thank you. Thank you.